Uh, but I want to welcome everybody here that's, uh, that's out worshiping with us. It is great to have you together. And actually, I've got some special welcomes. Are we ready for some special welcomes? Yeah, yeah. So we heard about this woman named, named this, this, uh, that Joyce had this mother who was baptized. But, you know, it's hard to see her on the Zoom boxes and whatnot. I want us to all be, I want to finally be able to introduce in person, Miss Julie. Where's Miss Julie? Hey, there's our new sister in Christ. Oh, oh, camera. Uh, yeah, there you go. There she is waving. <laughs> so that's awesome. Welcome to the family, Julie. That's amazing. Uh, there's also a family from Denver that's in town right now. There they are back there. Welcome, guys. Great to have you here. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and uh, I, I've got some. Uh, I, I've got some other folks to welcome that are going to be here for the summer, which I'm excited about. So there are some young Christians that were recently baptized in the Columbus Church of Christ that go to school at the Ohio State University, and they have come back to the motherland for the summer, and we are so excited to have them. So uh, we have got Mr. Okay, Nam. Rom, Rom, I'm sorry, I missed that one. <laughs> I'm sorry. Rom, give yourself a little wave there. Yeah, there we go. And there's a Jasmine that's in the house. Come on, Jasmine. And her sister, Richelli, is here, which is awesome. Um, and then there's another gentleman named Luke, but apparently he's out with his family on a vacation or something like that. I don't know why I guessed on your name. I have it written right here. Stick with the notes, dummy. Okay, there you go. Anyway. Um, Ron, you're from Solon, is that right? And where, uh, where are you guys? Okay, so you know what we do, guys. Come on, Mary, get to get those meals going. Get these guys over to your house. We got Solon and we've got West Side area. Amen. That's awesome. Welcome, guys. Welcome to Cleveland. It's great to have you here. Amen. Um, uh, if you, I should introduce myself. Uh, I am Ryan Painter, and uh, my wife and I lead the church here, and we're so grateful to be here. The Lord has given us a wonderful spring day, amen. So one, it was a good week all, all, all around in terms of uh, weather, and that's good stuff. But we're going to continue uh, with our sermon series on dynamic duos. And dynamic duos, uh, you've probably heard this before, but what it's all about is, you know, in the scriptures, God makes it very clear that the way that we grow spiritually is by being in relationship with one another. Our relationships within the body of Christ are the primary way that God uses uh, that God uses to really change us and to grow us into the men and women that he wants us to be. And so every week, we've been listening to some different dynamic duos. We hear from a dynamic duo in the scriptures, but then we also hear from a dynamic duo in the fellowship. We've had a number of people get up here and share, and that's awesome. Well, today, it's another special treat, right? Today, the title is Dynamic Trios. Oh, so there's an awesome dynamic trio that's been going on. And uh, I've asked them to come forward and just share what they've been doing together to kind of help each other to grow spiritually. And so can I get my dynamic trio to come on up? This dynamic trio biked to church together today, so... They're, they're feeling it. They're feeling it. Yeah. You ready? You ready? We're going to knock this out right now. I give you Dale, Norm, and Lou. We just follow right behind Lou. Oh, this is what we call drafty. I'm bite. I'm great drafting. <laughs> so, so throughout my life, I had made it a goal that I was not going to be one of the people in my family, in my neighborhood, who talked about the multiple prescriptions they took, how many heart attacks they had, uh, all of their ailments. I made a decision a long time ago that I was going to take charge of my health. Um, and even if I was gonna do it by myself, I was gonna do it. So for the last 15 years, I do about three marathons a year and I bike almost 2,000 miles um, each and every year. So I've made it such a high priority in my life, and I want it to be as long as I have my fingers and my feet, that it's gonna be a high priority. <laughs> now, 
Obviously, another high priority is, of course, the church, the fellowship, and the brothers. And I thought to myself, you know, what a great way to mix up a couple of these important aspects of my life. And I would try to, you know, get Norm and Dale to bike with me, you know, from church to the house or, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I, I, I start challenging Norm. Hey, Norm, let's get together and let's, let's do some walks. And we would do a couple miles at first. But now I mean, we've gotten to the point where we walk almost each and every week, five to seven miles each every week. In January, in December, well, not December, but January, <laughs> We were walking in almost two feet of snow. Oh, come on. Because we knew that it, it was more comfortable just to be home and just to relax. But it, it, we also knew that this was going to help build our relationship together. And, and you know, in, in my life, you know, being a part of these events, you know, like the bike rides and the marathon, there's nothing that brings out your true character than when you're uh, in the middle of adversity. You know, so it took me a while to kind of finally, finally challenge Norm to participate in the marathon. Oh, but somehow yeah. I got both Norm and Dale to yeah. sign up for the Cleveland Marathon oh, that's yeah. going to happen in August. And today was the very first day that Norm actually biked with us to church. Come on, man. But, you know, so Woo! you can see I'm trying to help facilitate these guys to also take charge of their health. But what it does for relationships is obviously it, it, it's, it's magical. I mean, yeah. the things that we talk about, how we hold each other accountable, uh, the things that we talk about, you know, um, we had a, we were watching on Zoom, uh, Norm and I, uh, a couple sharing and talking about how Christ is so valuable in their life. And Norm and I looked at each other. I'm like, we really don't do that. Like <laughs> we talk politics and home repair and we do some of those once in a while. But I just said, Norm, you know, we need to really kind of ramp it up, gear it up, and really talk about these because these need to be high priority in our lives. So anyway, um, I'm Norm, also known as Lou's Project. <laughs> and I, I wear that moniker proudly because, uh, uh, you know, one of the things I learned about Lou over time was his incredible love for doing the right thing and helping so many people out. Um, you know, I, I look at this Lot to Lose program that he started several years ago. And I don't know about you guys, but for me, I'm really skeptical, especially when there's money involved. And, you know, he started talking about this money, and I'm like going, I don't know if I feel comfortable about that. And what I learned is that, you know, in this whole program, whether you believe it or not, Lou does it when there's none of the money ever goes to him. It's 100% pass through and how the program works. He does it because he just loves. I mean, he cares and he loves and he wants people to live better lives. And that, and that really opened my eyes to, to build up this trust. And so there's this big part of the trust relationship that I, I really look at. And then the other part that I really admire about Lou is the sacrifice that he does. I mean, I, I, I go to work and I work with my brain all day long. Lou goes to work and he works with his body and his brain all day long. And he doesn't have to do it. He doesn't have to go out and walk five miles in the snow because he already did all of the hard work out in the snow. He does it because of me. And when you see someone extend themselves that way, it becomes a lot easier to really believe and build that relationship. And, but you know, where Lou went to at the end of that was the, the spiritual aspect. It's one thing to talk and to share and to be able to be spiritual, but there's another part that really brings it how much closer are we to God? And I, I couldn't help but think about Job. You know, when, when Job went through what he went through, his friends came together, and on the outward appearance, it looked like they were really good friends. I mean, they sat there for seven days and didn't say anything, and, and they, they looked on the outward side like they were doing right by each other. But when you really read through Job, you'll see that they weren't tied back to God, and they weren't saying things that were truly biblical. And in, in uh, Job 42, 7, um, God says to um, Eliphaz, he says, I am angry with you and your two friends because you have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. And as we challenge each other, it's like, all right, it's easy to do it on the go, right? As we're walking, as we're talking, and then it's easy to slip into opinions. But what I can do to give back to Lou is make sure that it's biblically based 
that I'm not speaking about what my thoughts and opinions are, but what God really says so that God doesn't become angry with me. Amen. And and that's really what I love about that and, and the relationships that we have here. And I've had others. I mean, I've had chances to talk to Brent almost on a daily basis for seven years as I drove into work and he was calling. But this is like, it's on the go. And it's, it's, it's discipling on the go. And, and it's a lot more effective in my life because I like to do things. And I, I, I have a hard time just sitting around. So anyway, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dale. Come on, Dale. 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 Ditto to what they said. Yeah. That's what he said he was going to say. I, said, I was going to go first, but that wouldn't have made any sense. So um, it's really about the camaraderie and the accountability that uh, I believe is the biggest benefit of what we do. Uh, as Norm just said, we like to be doing stuff. And rather than just going out and exercising on our own, when we do it together, there's something about the mind. Once you're trying with all your might just to keep up the loot, this things start coming out and your attitude and your openness or vulnerability, you see the true you and you, you see your true self. Um, the accountability part is great because when we talk one week about, hey, how are we going to be a better husband to our wives this week? Or how are we going to be a better father? I know they're going to follow up with me. And then having that time together helps me to stay on the course, as well as having accountability and just working out. My phone tells me on Saturday morning, it's going to take you 15 minutes to get to Kilgore Drive in Westlake, which is Norm's house, because it knows that I go there on Saturday morning. And we've developed a pattern to do that. We love riding bikes together. We love doing things. I'm convinced without a doubt, this whole marathon thing is a midlife crisis. <laughs> we said we have to do something. We have to, I, I, I talked about this before, careful who you pick as friends because they'll talk you into doing crazy things. Like this will be my third year of riding from Lake Erie to uh, Cincinnati. So that's a crazy bike trip that I go on with Lou and a few other disciples from the Ohio area. Uh, but the whole idea of we need to do something. Let's do something manly. Let's do something extreme. Last week or last year, I told Lou, I said, we got to pick something. After riding to Cincinnati, we're like, well, now we don't have anything to train for. So we decided we rode down to the Pro Football Hall of Fame one day and rode back oh, okay. just because we could. We uh, had a great time visiting Dave Wall and the Akron Church and stuff like that. So the whole idea is picking something to challenge ourselves and to be able to spend that time together and help each other out spiritually and physically. Great job, guys. So I've got these guys up here, and what I loved about it is, you know, it's COVID, right? Like everybody's just sitting around and, putting on pounds, and these are some guys that said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to do something awesome. And uh, today in the scriptures, we're going to look at a dynamic trio that didn't want to just sit around, but they wanted to go and do something awesome. Any idea who the dynamic trio is going to be from the scriptures? Well, it's none other than the standard trio you're probably thinking of. Yashua Beam, Eleazar Bendodo, and Shama. Yeah, that's who we're gonna study today, man. All the kids are all the kids like another kids kingdom lesson about Shama the Dodo or what was I don't know anyway. Turn your Bibles over to First Samuel chapter twenty-two. So Amen. Now you get to learn about three new guys in the scriptures. Amen. Uh, this is gonna take just a minute just to be able to kind of set up so you understand kind of who these guys are. Uh, we're going to go to 1 Samuel chapter 22, and we'll just talk about David here a little bit. David was a guy, was a shepherd, uh, was, a, was a young man, and he was a shepherd. Now, when we think of shepherds, sometimes we think of old men with canes and stuff like that. Shepherd back in the day, or actually shepherd even to this day, is anything but, you know, reserved for some type of old man. It is a young man's game, and it is a dangerous game. David was a shepherd, and he would fight off the lions and the tigers and the bears oh my probably not the tigers and, and, okay never mind um and uh, uh anyway but this got him ready and of course we know david uh there was this this horrible giants named goliath and no one and, and all of israel was totally intimidated 
But David said, you know what? I fought these, I fought off these animals. This is nothing because I serve the Lord my God and he's going to deliver me. And sure enough, we get that, uh, that slingshot there. He takes Goliath down, cuts his head off for good measure, just to, you know, just to do it. And uh, gains a lot of notoriety. David quickly becomes kind of the cat's meow of all of Israel. And everyone is loving David because he's the great military hero that has saved everyone. Well, everybody did not include one particular person. And that was King Saul, who got incredibly, uh, got, got incredibly jealous. And as a result, Saul was so jealous that he kind of he kind of gets this campaign going where he's, he's got this anti-David campaign. And he actually turns all of Israel on David to make David the bad guy. So much so that David has to go, he has to flee. He has to go into hiding. And he ends up in this place called Adullam, in this little cave called Adullam. And in 1 Samuel chapter 22, in verse 1, the scripture says this. David left Goth and escaped to the cave of Adullam. When his brothers and his father's household heard about it, they went down to him there. All those who were in distress or in debt or discontented gathered around him, and he became their commander. About 400 men were with him. So David is down, basically kind of hiding for his life. And Adlon, is, it, it's his cave that it's probably more of like a shelter or – maybe even a fortress, like that's kind of the, the area that, he, that, that he's at. Uh, but this is actually a spot where David actually writes a number of Psalms. You can go and look in the Psalms and it'll specifically say that he wrote many of these while he was during his time in Adullam. So kind of at that low point, he was still tight with God. But you know, not everyone in Israel was, you know, was, was buying the fact that David was this bad guy. And there was a lot of people that were very discontented with Saul. There was a lot of people very distressed by the whole situation. And apparently they weren't very good at making money because they were in debt also. And they go over to Adullam and they're like, David, no, like you should not have been out of here. And they are, be, are super loyal to David. And we don't learn a lot about these particular guys other than it says that David was made their commander. Now let's turn our Bibles over to 1 Chronicles chapter 11. That's right. Outdoor Bible study. We can do it. So as we turn there, you guys know the story. David ultimately does a, a, a ascend to the throne. He becomes the leader of all of Israel, and it's an awesome thing. But as he becomes the king, in chapter 11 and verse 1, the little subtitle is, David becomes king over Israel. Well, what do you need if you're a king? You need a lot of things, but you definitely need an army. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to read in verse 10. And David assembles a great army. It says here in verse 10, These were the chiefs of David's mighty warriors. They, together with all of Israel, gave his kingship strong support to extend it over the whole land as the Lord had promised. This is the list of David's mighty warriors. We're going to stop right there. And while we don't have this direct connection, it just makes a lot of sense that these warriors, these guys, that, that these men of renown that kind of come up and become David's warriors, it just makes sense that these are going to be some of the men that trained with him when he was in Adullam. In Adullam, it specifically said, uh, it, it specifically said in Adullam that they became his commander, or that David became their commander. David puts together an army, and here they are again. A very strong chance that uh, many commentators believe this is exactly where David's mighty men and his fighting men came from. I've got two simple points for us today. You ready? As we talk about relationships, it's kind of a war story. What are you talking about? Relationships? How does this all? Point number one, the bond of discontentment. The bond of discontentment. And I want to take us back in time a little bit, Cleveland Church. Ready to get back in time here, Cleveland Church? I want to take us back to the year of, what, 1993? Is that our church planning day? Yeah, there, there they are. 1991? 99, okay, you went like that. I was like, uh-oh, I got my numbers wrong. 1993, amen. And, uh, you know, 1993, that, that was a long time ago. That was, you know, close to 30 years ago. But uh, some things never change. 
And really the religious landscape of America really in that day has not changed too, too dramatically. I mean, there's definitely been some changes. But there was a, a, a group of churches that came together and said, we're, we're not going to do church like everyone else does church. We're not going to do church where you just kind of walk in, you kind of pick your own level of commitment, whatever you want to do, you can, no problem. Just show up whenever you please, whatever. We want to have a church that when you read the Bible, you're going to say, this is a church that's actually going to do these things, right? I remember being in college before I became a Christian. I literally remember I started reading the Bible on my own. And I remember having this thought, there's a good thing God doesn't actually expect us to do this. Yeah, that's what I literally thought. Because I'm just a good American church kid, right? You just get to pick whatever you want. But this particular church said, no, that, that's not the way it's supposed to go. We're, we're not on the throne. We don't get to tell God what we're going to do. It's probably supposed to be the other way around. With this Bible, is supposed to tell us what to do. And we need to do it. And so sure enough, this church started uh, planting other churches all over. In the great year of 1993, it was decided that a church planting was going to come to good old Cleveland, Ohio. Amen. And this church was made up of a band of, well, shall I say, discontented, distressed, definitely in debt, uh, men and women, men of renown, men like Vince Moore, the single man, Vince Moore. He's not here right now, but amen. We all know Vince. Eric Decker was on there. There was a nice married couple there with Barb and Dale Hawkinson. Amen. Woo. Who else we write down here? Mike and Jenny Scott. There's a lot of other people. And they moved here. And they said, yeah, we're going to start a church where we are going to call people to the standard of the scriptures. And people like, oh, I don't know, Robin Moore. I don't really know her maiden name. She got baptized into Christ, which was uh, really, really awesome. Mike Simpson was baptized into Christ. Lou and Della Wenner. I don't even know what Della's last name would have been at that particular time. They've got a, a bit of a story there. They became disciples of Jesus. So Elaine Toth becomes a disciple of Jesus. And, and next thing you know, there's this whole church of people that says, we're going to do exactly what the Bible says we're going to do. We didn't want just a church that had another form that just was another form of Christianity that lacked any conviction. It wasn't going to be a church where people kind of use the Bible as a salad bar and kind of pick and choose as you want. It wasn't going to be a church that, that just didn't have any biblical standards. It wasn't, it wasn't going to be a church where the roles were going to be reversed. This was going to be a church where the, Jesus was going to really be Lord and the lives of the disciples were going to reflect that, that Jesus was actually Lord. Amen. And I just remember for myself, uh, I remember just being a quote unquote Christian in my Methodist church. I, I was, I wasn't around during this time in Cleveland. I was down in uh, the Ohio State University. Amen. Come on, V. Come on, V. That's right, Dean. I see you there. He's got his, he's got his. But I remember being introduced to this group in Columbus and just seeing it. And, and honestly, it, it took about one service for me to realize something different is happening in this here room. Like, I don't know what this is. But sure enough, we got together, studied the Bible. And I mean, I, I had been a Methodist Christian for my whole life. And I wasn't exactly trying to live a godly life in Christ Jesus. And yet I could not remember a single conversation where I was ever once challenged on any area of my spiritual life for my entire life. Because that's just what church is, right? You don't, you're not supposed to talk about those things. There's lack of this authenticity. And it took all but about 15 minutes before I started getting those questions flying at me, you know, in my first Bible study, which sounds intimidating, but it was so refreshing because, well, I'd rather have somebody tell you, you want a doctor to lie to you or do you want a doctor to tell you the truth, right? You want a minister to lie to you or do you want him to tell you the truth about where you stand spiritually? I prefer knowing the truth, even though it, it might be hard to listen to. Guys, this was the church that was started. And over the years, so many people have become disciples and been baptized, and that's an awesome thing. But this is the church that needs to continue. It's the church that needs to continue. You know, if you're visiting with us, I encourage you to study the Bible. You might be a little bit afraid to do that right now as I, uh, <laughs> as I did that. But I encourage you to study the Bible and just get to know what do the, what do the scriptures actually say about what it means to be a Christian. The reality is we live in a very... A very, very lukewarm kind of religious landscape where, again, nobody's going to tell you nothing. And it's so refreshing to have people in your life willing to tell you what the truth really is. Amen. So, amen. It's okay to be a little bit discontented. Amen. 
it's a little bit okay to be distressed. And as we sit here in 2021, I just have a simple question for us. Are we the same church that we were in 1993? Are we the same church? And I realize a lot has changed and no, you know, you're never always going to be quite the same. But in terms of our core conviction, are we, a, are we a church that's still bothered by a religious landscape that doesn't really call people to the standard of the scriptures? Does that still bother us? Are we still distressed that so many people have this false hope of salvation that doesn't necessarily match up with the scriptures? And are we still in debt? Because I bet some of you are still in the debt. Amen. Fortunately, I don't think we're in debt anymore, so that's a good thing. But I think, you know, when we, there's something about when, when you get a bunch of people together that are unhappy with a situation, a bond forms. And here are these 400 men that came to Adalem, and that had, to have been a, that had to have been a rough Bible talk to start, that's for sure. But my oh my, there was something that was really bonding them together. They were discontented what, with, with what was going on. Church, we can be discontented about a lot of things. Oh, my goodness. Open up the politic jar there. Oh, my goodness. We can be discontented. And people join together and all that. How about we get discontented about what's going on here in Cleveland? How about we get more discontented about what's going on spiritually here in Cleveland? Let's band together. Let's go do some stuff for the Lord. Amen? Point number one, the bond of discontentment. Point number two, the bond of courage. The bond of courage. Let's read about these mighty men. Here we go, guys. In verse 11, this is the list of David's mighty warriors. Yeshoabam, a Hakamanite. Oh, there you go. There you go, Dale. Hakmanites. There you go. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Yeshoabam, a Hakmanite, was chief of the officers. He raised his spear against 300 men whom he killed in one encounter. Next to him was Eleazar, son of uh, Dodai, the Ahoahite one of the three mighty warriors. He was with David at Pas Damim when the Philistines gathered there for battle. At a place uh, there was for a, uh, at a place where there was a field full of barley, the troops fled from the Philistines, but they took their, strand, their stand in the middle of the field. They defended it and struck the Philistines down and the Lord brought about a great victory. Three of the 30 chiefs came down to David at the rock at the cave of Adullam, while a band of Philistines was encamped in the valley of Raphan. Uh, at the time, David was in the stronghold, and the Philistine garrison was at Bethlehem. David longed for water and said, Oh, that someone would get me a drink of water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem. So the three, uh, so the three broke through the Philistine lines, drew water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem, and carried it back to David. But he refused to drink it. Instead, uh, he poured it out to the Lord. God forbid that I should do this, he said. Should I drink the blood of these men who went at the risk of their lives? Uh, because they risked their lives to bring it back, David would not drink it. Such were the exploits of the three mighty warriors. Abishai, the brother of Joab, was the chief of the three. He raised a spear against 300 men whom he killed and so became as famous as the three. He was, he was doubly honored above the three and became their commander even though he was not included among them. They had some like organizational charts missing here. Benaniah, son of Jehoadiah, a valiant fighter from Kaz Kabzil, performed, a gra pre performed great exploits. He struck down Moab's two mightiest warriors. He also went down into a pit on a snowy day and killed a lion. And he struck down an Egyptian who was five cubits tall. It's about a little over seven feet tall. Although the Egyptian had a spear like a weaver's rod in his hand, Benaniah went against him with a club. He snatched the spear from the Egyptian's hand and killed him with his own spear. Such were the exploits of Benaniah, son of Jehoiada. He, too, was as famous as the three mighty warriors. He was held in greater honor than any of the 30, but he was not included among the three, and David put him in charge of his bodyguard. All right, we'll stop there. There's this thing with three in here, right? There's like the three, the three. But the three ended up inspiring so many guys that I guess they weren't allowed into that particular club, but... They did some amazing things, too. I personally like that it says the three. Not just three of them, the three. As a Buckeye, I appreciate it. I hear Ohio State has now trademarked the word the. So being a that, – that's true. That's actually true. They tried to trademark the word the. So anytime I hear you say the word the, you owe me a nickel. I graduated from there. So there we go. There we go. That's how it works. That's how it works. 
But again, just men doing these incredible exploits, killing 300 men, standing his ground in a barley field, kills Moab's top two guys. The guy kills a lion in a snowy pit. The other guy kills some seven foot warrior using his own spear against him. Um, you know, as I read these types of stories, I can't help but to think back to the days of glory, amen, uh, that I experienced as a young Christian. Maybe you guys remember this, this little group. This group like lives in infamy. The making of a mighty man of God. You guys know what I'm talking about? Come on, Jose. If you want to get a good laugh, there's a bunch of, a bunch of us on this picture here. And uh, we are young. Amen. We are very young in that picture. You know, we are, we, you know what also we are in this, uh, in this picture? We were very dumb in this picture. Very, very dumb. But we were also very courageous. Amen. Let me explain. We've, Tom Caswell put together a group of guys. He said, let's just do some crazy stuff for the Lord. And we would come together super early on Saturday mornings. I would typically be 15 minutes late. Uh, and we would just get these lessons and these challenges. Yeah, uh, sometimes more like an hour late, right, Jose? Yeah, there we go. That's, that's about right. <laughs> um, but, but Tom would give us these challenges. And there would be all kinds of different challenges. But it was, it was like, do something radical for God. So one week it would be like, go do some kind of like radical prayer. And I remember Chris Kreppage came in the next Saturday. And we're like, what would you do? He said, I, I don't even know where he's living. Somewhere, I don't know where he was, but he said, I walked to midweek and just prayed the entire time. Like, dang, that was like a five-hour walk to midweek. We were all inspired by that. Uh, Jose went street preaching. I think I joined you. That, that's always a very frightening experience right there. And Nick Schradel and I, this is the dumbest thing I've ever done. We decided to get super radical. And so we went to downtown Akron, and there was like a gentleman's club there, right? And we went and decided, no, we didn't go in, but we went outside the building. And literally every man that walked in there, we started inviting them out to Bible study. Okay, that was the scariest thing I ever did. I don't know how we made it out alive on that one. Uh, brothers inviting 500 people to church. Uh, it was awesome. It was a lot of fun, and it built a lot of memories. Now, I realize you can't live that way every day, right? Like, it's just hard to live in this continual state of just being unbelievably radical. But let me tell you something. When you get a bunch of guys together and they start doing some great stuff, it becomes inspiring to the others and you kind of want to go for it a little bit more. Almost like some one-upmanship. And I kind of read that in this passage, right? Like they're doing, this guy did this. Oh, yeah? You killed that guy? I killed a lion. Oh, yeah? You killed a lion? I killed a giant with his own spear. I would have loved to have been part of those meetings. But, but what ends up happening is courage inspires courage. When you hear somebody doing something great, no matter what it is, it makes you go, man, what am I doing? You know, as you guys heard about those guys training for a marathon, I bet some of the brothers and the sisters just started thinking, it was just a small passing thought, like, maybe I should do something like that. Because when we hear about people doing stuff that, that just, they deny themselves, they don't do what they want, they do something for a greater cause, there's something inside of us that all oh, we want that. And as much as we want the comforts of the everyday life, there's something inside of us that's very unfulfilled by the comforts of everyday life. And it makes us just want to do more and more and more. When you see your brother go into a snowy pit to kill a lion, you go, man, I need to step up my game. When you see a guy stand in a barley field and take on an entire army, you go, Man, what am I doing for Israel? When you see a brother or sister share their faith in a grocery store with some just stranger, you go, man, what am I doing with my life? When you hear of a sister fasting from food because she desperately wants to get closer to God, it just makes you go, where am I in my walk with God? When you hear a teen disciple decide to stand up and say, you know what, bag it, I don't care about the peer pressure. I'm going to follow Jesus, and I don't care what anybody in this high school says. You go, yeah, maybe I should be doing something like that as well. You see, guys, courage inspires courage. And great bonds happen when we just get together and we do stuff. Amen? Amen. Is, that, is, that, is that general enough? You just got to go out and do stuff. And that's my challenge for you, right? I got a challenge for you. this uh, Not this week, because I don't want you to rush it. But I want us all to think about just something that we can do for God. And it can be something weight loss oriented. It can be evangelism oriented. It can be your 
your walk with God, memorizing scripture. I don't care what it is. You don't even have to tell me what it is. But I want you to take some time and I want you to think about it. Because as we're coming out of COVID, as we're coming out and, you know, quarantine, and I don't know, we're not totally coming out of COVID. Anyway, I don't want to go through all that. But you know what I'm saying? The, the world's starting to open back up. I think a lot of us need to shake the dust off. Amen. And I want you to think about for your life, what's something radical that you can do to really inspire your own walk with God? And let's do some things like that and maybe share with the fellowship some of the things that you're doing. Let's get more of a radical spirit back in the Cleveland church. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. You know, lastly, I, uh, um, I, I just want to talk about the story here of, of them going and fetching this water, right? So, all right, this is going to sound really weird, especially coming from a minister on a Sunday morning. But I've been watching my friend Norman. is a, uh, he's, he's my German friend Norman over there. And I, I love World War II. I don't know why. I don't love World War II. I hate World War II. I love learning about World War II. And there's this interesting documentary that came out about Nazi Germany. And it was all about kind of Hitler's, like all the guys underneath Hitler. And you would think with an army that was able to accomplish as much as they were able to accomplish, they would be this unified machine. But it, it wasn't that way at all. They all hated each other. And they were all kind of, they were all kind of uh, jockeying for position under Hitler. They all wanted to be Hitler's right-hand man. And they were going against each other and trying to hurt each other and get their ear of Hitler and all this sort of stuff. And then even when the, the when it looked like uh, uh, Germany was going to fall, they all started plotting with the English and, you know, the Brits and everybody of, huh, they started going behind Hitler's back to try to like gain the, you know, the, the, become the Fuhrer of whatever this new Germany was going to be. Anyway, it was all these men that were under the command of Hitler, but they weren't remotely unified. As I read this story here, oh, I lost my spot. Oh, well, I'll, you guys, we already read it once. But as I read about this story of them going and fetching that water for David, here's three guys willing to risk their lives, and they do it together to honor their commander. And David is so moved by this, he says, I can't drink this water because I, it would be a dishonor to them. And I guess what I'm seeing in the scriptures is total unity, right? Total unity. Israel was unified. These guys aren't jockeying for position. They're not trying to get one another. They're all in this together, and they want to do what's best for the greater good of Israel. You see, guys, when we do great things together, we kind of leave our egos to the side, and it's just all about the, be the betterment of the group. I love what Norm said. You know, um, Lou doesn't need another workout. Like, Lou works out play. He doesn't need another one. But the whole reason he's doing it is for his brothers. Not for himself, but for his brothers. That's such a great spirit, and that's so amazing. As we turn our attention to communion, by the way, does anybody need the little communion cup? Raise your hand if you do. Oh, my wife's earning her keep today. <laughs> Look at that. Keep your hand, keep your hand raised, and I'll, uh, I'll extend this portion out a little bit. <laughs> so we got to get to a lot of people. Oh, come on, Shed. Yeah, Shed, mighty man, Shed. It's like I'll take up the. There you go. Amen. But as we turn our attention to communion, you can see these elements at work in the life of Jesus. And we talked about early on the bond of discontentment. Jesus is a guy, you especially see it when he arrives in Jerusalem. He's discontent. He's discontented that the religious leaders have completely missed the boat. They've completely missed the heart of God. And they've created a very corrupt Israel. And he doesn't want it at all. And he's willing to go there and say some very difficult things. He publicly gets up in Matthew 23 and says some very difficult things. And he knew very well and when you say things like he said against the religious you know, community, that it was going to cost him his life. But his discontentment said, you know what, I don't care. If I got to die, that's what I got to do. We've got to fix this situation. We also see a, uh, the bond of courage. Is there, anything more, is there anything more courageous than dying on a cross? I would say the only thing more courageous than dying on a cross was knowing that you're going to die on a cross before you die on a cross. And still be willing, before it all starts, to say, you know what? I'm still willing to do it. To die on the cross and have no power is one thing. You're stuck. 
But to die on a cross and have all the power of the world to say, I don't have to go on there and to continue, that's courage. Guys, let's let the courage, let's let even the discontentment of Jesus really inspire us. To really just take stock of where we are spiritually. Let's not be the church that we don't want to be. Let's be the church that we really truly want to be. We want to be God's church. We want to be a church that's making disciples. We want to be a church that's living out the Bible. Let's take the courage that we get from Jesus from the cross. Amen? Let's pray. Well, thank you for our time together. God, thank you for calling us to this life. God, thank you for calling us to be disciples of Jesus. It is so awesome, God, uh, to live this life. And God, this life is hard, and this life we can shrink back, and I, I feel it in my own life, God. But God, help us to take up the courage. God, help us to be discontented with where we are right now, but also, God, just help us to be courageous to fix whatever problems we got. We thank you so much for Jesus. And we know that even despite all of our problems, it's all about the cross that washes us clean. And God, as messed up as we are, you look down on us and you just see, you just see us wearing these white robes, Father. And that's all because of the blood of Jesus. We thank you for this time. We love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.